Uh, before we start, are there uh, any questions or comments from our discussions that anybody wants to ask or bring up? I may get to it in the lecture. Oh, you guys are just so smart. You took it all in. Or do you tell me to ask? I was going to say that. First Peter chapter 2 this week, and uh, remember, uh, we go through the Bible, and we like to look at the Bible in pieces these days, you know, whether it's quote, chapter, verse, but chapters and verses uh, weren't around from the very beginning, so think about chapter 2 as really just a continuing flow of God that's leading from chapter 1. Chapter 1, we talked a little bit about who uh, God's people are, who these Jews are. Remember, they are living, uh, let me get my little pointer up. Am I still in praying here? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, Peter, writing from either Rome or Jerusalem, uh, is... Addressing the people in this area right here, what is now modern-day Turkey. And this is sort of the backwoods of uh, the Roman Empire. You know, all the cities are down here. These are these are sort of the cities that Paul would like to visit. Peter's more concerned up here. Um, these people were still very much living in the Roman Empire. These were Jews, Christian Jews, living uh, basically in exile. They're people of the Dispersion, you know, Jews that don't live uh, in or around uh, you know, where Judea was at that time. There were lots of Jews scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And we know Peter was known as the Apostle to the Jews, so this book is very much in keeping uh, with that title. He's also known as the Apostle of Hope, because in chapter 1, that, that's a big theme that he touches on is our hope. Not in this life, this life where we're encountering suffering hope in the next life. That's the life that we belong in. And we finish by saying that really this life is just the beginning of eternity. This is where it starts. And we have a hope we can look ahead. This is all because of Jesus Christ. So, Peter says, therefore, feed yourself like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. <clears throat> the statement comes after Peter exhorts his audience to holiness just as Jesus is holy. How do we become holy? We can't wake up and just expect to, boom, now I'm like Jesus. Or, you know, we can't, you know, take a miracle tonic and then all of a sudden we are holier people. No, we have to feed ourselves with spiritual things. This is the spiritual milk is spiritual things like loving one another, by practicing love, by being in fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, by praying and reading scripture, by going to church on Sunday. This is how we feed ourselves. We start out small with spiritual milk. <clears throat> Babies can't eat solid food. I remember at Thanksgiving this past year, my older sister who just had a baby made a big announcement. Don't feed the baby. <laughs> As I had turkey right outside. <laughs> right there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Baby's got to have milk. And it's the same with us baby Christians. We have to feed ourselves so that we can grow into maturity. So that we can begin to mature in our relationship with God. But not just with God. What follows is a holy relationship with our brothers and sisters. Peter is trying to tell them in this chapter, one theme that he's touching at is how do we live as Christians? How do we go about living out the Christian life in this world that doesn't really like Christians at all and is in fact persecuting and putting them to death? So he gets into a subject then on stones, <clears throat> living stones. And Greg pointed out to me, Greg Jones pointed out to me just before 
that uh, you know Peter is writing with his past experiences in mind, uh, namely when Peter uh, announced you know pronounced Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the Living God. Jesus said, "You are a rock, and on this rock I will build my church." And so it's interesting that Peter is using analogies of stones, then of stones being built up on Christ, the foundation, as an, <clears throat> as an analogy for the church. Whereas Paul, when he encountered Christ and had a very physical reaction in his conversion and his blindness, he talks about the church as a body. So you have two different ways of looking at the church. It's a, in one sense, it's a body, but in another sense, it's a temple. Now, Peter is using uh, the analogy of stones uh, in the knowledge that he's speaking to Jews. In Jewish culture and in Jewish religion, going back centuries, the center of their faith was in the temple. This is where God dwelt, in the temple in Jerusalem. Those were holy stones that housed God. That was the center of their worship, their belief, their faith, everything was built on that. Now, around the time of Peter's writing, the temple was completely destroyed. And so that left the Jews sort of homeless. Jewish Christians sort of had a different way of looking at it. Uh, and I want to talk about uh, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 19 through 24. This is when Jesus, being a little thirsty, stops at a well and he runs into a Samaritan woman. And they get into a little discussion. And this Samaritan woman, leading kind of a sinful life, you know, we're all sinners, okay. But she tries to dodge sort of Jesus' knowing questions and statements by saying, all right, you're a prophet, let me ask you this. Is the right place to worship here on this mountain where our Samaritan ancestors worship or in the temple in Jerusalem? And Jesus says, there's going to be a time where you will worship God in spirit and truth. This is what Peter is getting at right here. Jesus has established a living temple of which he is the cornerstone. He is that foundation of the temple. And we are built on top of that. And this temple, of course, belongs to all ethnicities and nationalities. And here I have a picture. This is sort of underground right now, but in the first century, this is, this is the last remaining portion, along with the western wall outside, of the Hebrew temple. And you see the giant stones, which... Uh, modern science still can't really understand how they got there <laughs> because they are so massive even our modern uh, construction things couldn't even move it so how did that stone get there amazing thing mm -hmm. and then he gets into the subject of because you are he says you are a holy priesthood first starting in verse 4 of chapter 2 come to him to that living stone chosen by men, but in God's sight, chosen and precious. And like living stones, be yourselves built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we are in this temple, but we are also, we also share in a priesthood where we offer sacrifices of thanks to giving. And here you have the old form of the Levitical priesthood offering sacrifices for the sins of many, here we have our Christian priesthood. We're following the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross. And here we have that quote and cool um, from John. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And it wouldn't be a lecture by me if I didn't include some church fathers. It. Clement of Alexandria says that we are a chosen people is clear enough. But Peter said that we are a royal people because we have been called to share Christ's kingdom and we belong to him. We are a priesthood because of the offering which is made in our prayers and in the teachings by which souls which are offered to God are one. We are part of that priesthood because of our prayers for the saints by living together and by abiding in the teachings we receive from the church. <coughs> And then, oh, didn't cite this one. Be 
because you are a priestly race, you are able to approach the sanctuary of God. You see, in the Old Testament priesthood, only the Jewish priest could enter into the Holy of Holies and, and operate there and worship there. With, with Christ's sacrifice on the cross, that veil is torn in two. And all of us are welcome into God's presence by Jesus' sacrifice. He makes it possible through his death. So, after establishing this, we're uh, living stones. We are a holy priesthood offering sacrifices. If we get into honorable conduct, this was a sticky subject. I remember reading a book called The Lost Letters of Pergamum. It's a book of basically letters exchanged between a guy named Herodotus, I believe, and St. Luke. They're exchanging letters to each other, basically how evangelism was done. And Herodotus, who's not a Christian, is marveling as he continues to come into contact with Christians that they're normal people. They aren't sacrificing babies underground and drinking blood. The guy working, you know, in the public library, that's a Christian. That member, that guy who's an outstanding member of the community, is a Christian. He's seeing that all these people, they're just normal. Extremely normal. They're involved in the community. They actually do a lot of good charitable stuff. Christians aren't so bad. Actually, they're pretty good. And so really, that's what Peter is exhorting his, uh, his uh, audience to do, is to just be good. Act like what you profess. Namely, abstain from passions of the flesh. This was a big issue, then especially, because Gentiles really didn't have many rules regarding what you can do and not to do with your body. The Christians, however, were different. Abstain from that. Abstain. Keep your body pure because Christ bought you. Your body belongs to him now. And so by doing this, you are presenting yourselves uh, to the Gentiles as honorable, as good people. Their assumptions about you that you're a criminal, that you are a low life because you don't subscribe to the Roman deities – Shows that they're really wrong. Hilary of Arles uh, explains evil desires are called carnal because they operate through the flesh, but in reality they are spiritual because they come from the soul. If you've been transformed by Christ, don't let yourself be held captive by those things which hurt your soul and keep you away from Christ. This is a good reminder for all of us because it's the same situation today as it was then. Hold on to your dignity. Hold on to it. And then finally, uh, Paul, uh, sorry, Peter, gets into a discussion about uh, respecting the authorities. He says, let me see. Mm -hmm. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors that, as are sent by him, to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. So, this can be a little misinterpreted, right? We are not of this world, yet we are in this world. Therefore, Peter is saying, and be subject to those human institutions that rule over you. For the Lord's sake, because the Lord has established and given these human institutions authority. Authority to make justice and punish wrongdoing. Now, there was a weird thing. Christians were seen as subversive to human to, to the Roman society, basically, because, namely, they would not burn incense to a statue of the emperor. The emperor was seen as a god, and that's really where the Christians, uh, where they where they could get them if they wanted to martyr them and uh, and have them under trial, is make them deny the emperor, and then they. Could now, Peter's saying, no, honor the emperor, but don't burn incense to him. For the Lord's sake, don't burn incense to him, but honor the, the human institution insofar as it is in line with 
God's revealed word. Are y'all following me there? Are there any questions? It is the blind said, the fear of God must come first and govern all the rest. Now, slaves, take comfort in suffering unjustly because that means you're imitating Jesus. Peter isn't uh, condoning slavery at this point. But the sad fact is, is poor Christians, and I believe Andrew Wright gets into this, uh, poor Christians and slaves often did convert to Christianity despite the wishes of their master and would therefore suffer greatly because they couldn't obey their master in some issues that were opposed to their faith. And so Peter's saying, don't worry. If you are suffering for doing good, you are following in the example of Christ. And I really like what N.T. Wright had to say. Peter has glimpsed a deeper truth behind the moral quagmire. He invites followers of Jesus to inhabit Jesus' extraordinary story, to embrace it as their own, and being killed and rescued by those events, to make them the pattern of their lives as well. By suffering, you take part in Christ's suffering. That's an amazing thing, because that Christly suffering really is our identity in suffering in this world. So take joy in that, because God is blessing you. <coughs> Any questions? That's all I have. Thank you all very much. I have a question. Yes. I, I, I struggled in the difference between in this world and of this world. Yes. I don't know whether I'm just not smart enough to figure that out. But I no, we, we are in this world because <coughs> our bodies are inhabit this earthly reality. This skin and, you know, clothes, we inhabit that. We're in this world. But by through our participation in Christ, through our baptisms, we are made citizens of the world to come. We belong in the next world now. Yet for now, we are in this world. Okay. Born again in the spirit. Born again in the spirit. By water and spirit, yes. Yes. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.